Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving up a, a glorious end of October Saturday afternoon to be with us on this very special occasion. I'd like to welcome everybody here, the friends, colleagues of Roberts and Nellifers, also distinguished guests, including uh, former Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister, former Minister Justice Charlie Fanning, but so many people. Um, I won't go into name by name welcomes, but let me assure you, we are very delighted that you could all be here this afternoon. Each of us, I think, has our own special memories of Robert. Now, for me, he was an invaluable contributor to my programs on News Talk. Uh, sometimes we spoke remotely, uh, and sometimes when he was having some well-deserved R&R at home on the Vico Road, he'd make his way into the studio, and we could have a free-flowing conversation, which was uh, uninterrupted by the, the glitches that uh, are so common and so prevalent when you're trying to talk to a correspondent in, in the war-torn zones from which Robert often reported. I like to think of Robert as, as my eyes and my ears. Um, you know, you get your pictures sitting on the tele at home and watching the television. But they're pictures which come through a particular prism, a particular filter. And when we got to talk to Robert, we knew we were getting a personal testimony of what was going on in the places from which he was reporting. I regarded Robert, although I rarely told him so, as being intrepid, as being brave, and something I did tell him from time to time, that he was forensic because his eye for detail, his determination to demonstrate the provenance of everything he was reporting was absolutely overwhelming. He put himself in harm's way again and again. And he did that so that he could stand over what he said or what he wrote with the conviction of the witness. He lived, I think, our contemporary history. But it was also something that was informed by his scholarship into our past history. Past history of past wars, of catastrophe, and of the devastation that colonialism caused throughout our globe. He was an educator, he was an advocate, he was a tour de force, and I believe that our audience is much the poorer for his passing. There was a, another side to Robert as well. Uh, he was a man who enjoyed a pint or two in the hostelries in Dorky, and he was a good neighbour uh, to the community. For example, I see David McWilliams here. Any time that David would make that call, Robert, any chance you could do the Dorky Book Festival? And the inevitable answer was a swift yes, with the caveat, conflicts permitting, <laughs> because there was any call to arms and uh, Robert was off. Now, although he spent so much time in Beirut, it was a very good base from which he could be nimble in responding to the challenges which were presented by Iraq or Syria or Iran. Um, his heart, I think, was really set in his home, the home he and his wife, Nellifer, created on Kalani Bay. Now, I've had the pleasure of an afternoon of sipping coffee and stopping treats with Robert and Nellifer while enjoying the beautiful vista of the bay in front of us. So, Dorky was a home first, but also an office, an archive, a library, a hive of research and scholarship. Before Robert died, himself and Nellifer had finished the construction of a home for his papers. And I don't know if some of you have been there, what a treasure trove you will find there. Original sources, original documents, newspapers from decades ago. And they're so fascinating because they give a contemporary feel. You may be looking at one particular historical event, but when you read all the rest of the stories contained in that newspaper, it lets you know how people feel and how people were reacting to the stories of, of the day. So, there's a beautiful building, and the contents of Robert's archive will rest there, but the task of organizing that archive now falls to his beloved Nelfer. Uh, for those of you who don't know Nelfer, probably very few people in the room who do not know her, but my goodness, what a life she has had. What a challenging life. She was born in Kabul in Afghanistan during the time of the Soviet invasion. Her family fled to Pakistan where they lived as refugees before finding a welcoming refuge in Canada. And there she, in spite of English being a second language, not a first language, she went to study journalism and English literature in university there. 
And it's probably that course alone that gave rise to the great romance of their lives. Um, a few people, including Elva, were organizing lectures, college lectures, as many of us have done in our past lives. And one of the speakers was Robert Fisk. And uh, after that lecture, they corresponded. He came back the following year. And um, the friendship developed so much so that he uh, gave her a present of one of his books, which he inscribed to her, and then gave her the rights to make a documentary of the book. Now, what, what a brilliant start for a career as a documentary. The book was Pity the Nation. They became friends, and when Nelifer was doing her master's research work in refugee camps in Pakistan and Iran, Robert joined her. They worked together. Robert proposed to her in Peshawar, and a few years later, as you will hear, they got married in Baalbek in Lebanon. Now, Nelfer worked as a journalist for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, she's written, directed several films, Kandahar, Return to Kandahar, Audition, Act of Dishonor, and she is the co-writer and one of the four producers of what we are about to see in a few moments' time. It's called This Is Not a Movie. She has won awards for her radio and television documentaries for her book, A Bed of Red Flowers, In Search of My Afghanistan. Robert and Nelifer were a partnership in work, in life, and in love. Robert used to refer to their life together as living in paradise. Well, paradise is lost, as you know. And with Robert's passing, Nelifer is dedicated to completing his archive, editing and publishing his final work, as well as pursuing her own career as a journalist and documentary maker. What a pair they were. And what a wonderful individual is our host this afternoon. Will you welcome, please, Nelifer Bazir. Thank you, Pat. We will introduce, beyond this expectation, um, Robert used to say, I know who to call when I need a PR person. So echoing Robert's appreciation, I'd like to say thank you for that fine introduction. Good evening. I'd like to begin by saying a big thank you to each and every one of you for being here tonight. A year ago this day, the world lost a brilliant mind, a fearless, outspoken, honest journalist, a brave intellectual, a methodical researcher and scholar, and a historian of the present, in the words of one of his colleagues. Robert was the most relentless, dedicated anti-war reporter. Northern Ireland, the war in Northern Ireland, shaped Robert's thinking about reporting wars. And as you will see in the film, Northern Ireland prepared him for the Middle East. And in the Middle East, Robert crossed borders in a manner, leaving a legacy that is unmatched by any other foreign correspondent. But it wasn't just going to the front lines and reporting from the war zones that distinguished Robert as a journalist. It was his knowledge of history. It was his moral, principled stance against war, against injustice and brutality, combined with his courage and the gift of writing that set him apart from the rest. And for that, Robert was loved, despised, admired, envied, and everything in between. But one thing that no one could deny, even including his critics, was his integrity. A year ago this day, I lost a man, my husband, my life as I used to tell him. A man who stunned my family and surprised me during our wedding ceremony when he delivered his marriage vows in Persian my native language. Robert organized that whole wedding himself. The place was Baalbek, the site of the tallest Roman columns and still standing, as he used to say. And only the Lebanese would appreciate the context of a mixed marriage taking place in Baalbek, Lebanon. Robert was many things to many people, but to me, he was a man who loved from the depth of his soul. He was the fortunate kind of man that was very emotional and never shied away from expressing his emotions. 
I've never known anyone like him. A brilliant and outstanding mind, yet he would panic when the Word document that he was writing, because of some computer glitch, would shrink in size. He'd be afraid that he lost his story. He used to call me his tacky wife, because I could press a few keys and get the computer screen back to its normal. I loved the vulnerabilities in him as much as I admired and loved the strength of his character and that agile mind which never paused, stopped from learning, observing, storing, creating, loving, living life to the full and enjoying life, as Pat mentioned. Robert was the first Englishman to deliver the bloody Sunday Memorial Lecture in Derry in 2004. He died as an Irish citizen. Such a proud Irish citizen that he wanted his archives and our library to stay in Ireland. And as Pat mentioned, in Robert's absence, I have been sorting through his papers and I have a lot more to do. And I'm grateful to the help of several people. You know who you are. I would also like to briefly thank the friends and colleagues who supported Robert's application, the kind friend who advised and helped him, who is here tonight, and the two people, two individuals in the Ministry of Justice, who with their due diligence and efficiency made it possible for Robert to receive his citizenship on that day in 2019, when we also had the pleasure of meeting Deputy Flanagan who's also here tonight. It meant a lot to Robert, it means a lot to me. When I first mentioned the idea of making this film to Robert, he was reluctant. He was afraid that the film would interfere in his work. He met with Yang Chang, our director, and the Ray Bonajan, the cinematographer. He was impressed with him. Yang is a very good filmmaker, and the Raid is an amazing director of cinematography. Together, their back, with their backgrounds, they brought a unique perspective to the project. Young is Chinese-Canadian and Doreen and Iraqi-Canadian who was on the set of Earth Locker, among other great films. But Robert insisted that they, there will not be no second takes, that he should not be asked to repeat or go back and restart. Young and Doreen took this challenge and they devised the film on the go. We filmed for about a year with Robert. Robert was also touched by a gracious gesture from a man he admired as a neighbor and a friend, a Bono. Bono not only kindly agreed for us to use Cedars of Lebanon as the only song in the film, but went out of his way to get sign off from you two and all the parties for a gratis license. So on behalf of Robert and the production, I'd like to thank Bono and you two for that. As you will see, I stayed away from being on camera in this documentary. It was a conscious decision in my part. Robert and I lived a very private life, and I also did not want our personal story to take away from the focus on the importance of journalism and Robert's work as a foreign correspondent. When we were filming, one of the things that we could not unfortunately include in the film because of the time constraint, was a debate about media between Robert and Gideon Levy. Gideon told us that there are more reporters going to the war zones nowadays, that they hop from conflict to conflict, they stand in front of burnt buildings taking selfies, tweeting news reports, and often sending identical dispatches home. It was more about them than the actual story. Reporting was hard work, an act of selflessness, and standing up to the pressures. Robert didn't care how he looked on camera. He cared about what he had to say, and how to say it, and more importantly, why that message had to be communicated. This is relevant more than ever before, because of the convoluted and contested media climate, and because of our political chaos. The Taliban are back in my native home, Afghanistan. Robert's beloved 
we wrote is on the verge of total collapse. Fascism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism are increasing in places we consider our democratic societies. And with the plague of nationalism, intolerance, and religious extremism, the responsibility of journalism and journalists is far greater than ever before. Robert's voice is needed more than ever before, as we discussed in David's podcast and um, with Martina's article in the Irish Independent of yesterday. And I hope there are people who would carry on Robert's work for him. This is not a movie premiered at the Toronto Film Festival, which was the last in-person festival before the pandemic. Robert received a standing ovation in both of the public screenings of more than 400 people each. But the production had to cancel all our in theater screenings because of COVID and we scrambled to go digital. So tonight, this is the first public screening of This Is Not A Movie In Ireland, thanks to the IFI, Ross, David, and their team, and to the National Film Board of Canada, and HLD, and Natalie Bourdon for making this possible. Robert and I used to talk about famous last words. Robert's last words to me were, tell me you love me. Of course I love you, I said. A simple response, but a reminder that it is important to tell the people in our lives that we love them when they are with us. And I would like you to leave you with a quote from Rumi. Goodbyes are only for those who love with their eyes, because for those who love with heart and soul, there is not such a thing as separation. Thank you all again for being here with me tonight. And here is This Is Not A Movie to Robert. <laughs>